I'm Patrick from the Poison Pen Bookstore, and we're here with another of our uh, virtual events. Um, and tonight we have a very, very exciting event. Uh, and it, it's pretty cool. Uh, just today, a lot of you know, the, uh, the Edgar Award nominations were announced. And uh, one of our guests today, Quay Corte, uh, was nominated for his book here, The Missing American. And uh, it's very exciting. Congratulations, Quay. Thank you. And um, and we decided we kind of enlist a, you know an up and coming little known writer um, to come in and talk to Quay today. <laughs> so uh, we got our we got our good friend Michael Connolly um, to come in and talk. Thanks, Mike. Came off, just came off the street. Yeah, it's always <laughs> great to see you. Um, Glad to be here. Yeah, and um, and Barbara is tuning in from home, and she'll be doing the heavy lifting. And I'm going to be largely in the background, but if you have uh, questions for Quay or Mike or Barbara, um, go ahead and type them in, and I'll be sort of monitoring the, the Facebook feed for your questions. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Barbara. Thank you, Patrick. I'm holding up the book because inevitably I forget to say that we have, I'm going to splinter it, there we go, we have autographed copies that Quay was kind enough to sign for us of Sleep Well, My Lady, which is the second book in the series that we are here to talk about this evening. So congratulations on your Edgar nomination. That's really exciting. Thank With breaking you. news Thank here at the Poison Pen. Yeah, it was so it was really something, really something. Uh, it's not something you you don't write thinking, oh, well, I think this is going to be an award. You never do that. <laughs> at least I certainly don't. So when it happens, it's 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 a surprise. Well, your companion here, Mr. Connolly, who stumbled in off the street to help us tonight, we well remember. <laughs> we well remember when he was nominated for the Edgar, and we well remember his first ever event. So, I have to say, there's a nice parallel here going on this evening. Nice, season. very but nice. Let me ask you before you talk about this new series, because we haven't really spoken to you much. Um, you you started out writing a different series in yeah. West African crime. Um, with a detective whose name is, do I have it right, Darko Dawson? Right. And, right, Darko um, Dawson. Right. So why did you decide to shift to a new character? Did you said all you wanted to say about Darko? No, he, he's actually coming back. But um, it. I think that somebody said something, actually, it might have been Michael, I'm not sure, but he said something about, you know, on the fifth the fifth book, you have to sort of start evaluating which way you're going. Uh, <laughs> and Death by His Grace was the fifth the fifth one. And by then I just introduced a new female character that I was gonna do like a spin-off um, off the Darko Dawson series. Uh, but Juliet in her Juliet Grames in all her wisdom, my my editor said, No, if it's gonna be a new series, it's gotta be a new series. <laughs> So that that's how that that came about. So um, it be, and I'm glad I did it that way because it relieved me of um, you know having Darko sort of looking looking over my shoulder at what was going on, <laughs> and because he's a very strong character, so he might sort of get in the way. That's an excellent point. So Mike, you obviously in some ways provided a template for writers because you know after what was it four much. No, it was four, wasn't it, that you wrote the poem? Yeah, but I, I didn't have a plan. I was just kind of stumbling around in the dark, and then afterwards, I could act like it was all planned. And I, <laughs> <laughs> but, you, it's been a great bluff that you've run on all of this, and many people have benefited from it. Yeah. So, um, Mike, I'll turn this over to you. I would, at some point, like to explore just a little bit with Quay um, about West African noir. I mean. It's, it's an interesting sunshine noir, I see sometimes that's applied to it also, although I think of sunshine noir, to be honest, is Florida. So I, yes, that, you know, yes, it's a little yeah, hard a to point there, yeah. At some point, <laughs> I think it would be interesting to talk a little bit about West African mystery series and all, but yeah. that's up to Mike. So yeah. Michael, take it over. Well, on that subject, I was gonna ask a question about that and Barbara, you saying West African noir um, makes it seem like it's a you know a big field. Like I I write about L.A. and I'm only I think the ten thousandth person to write about L.A. 
<laughs> but I, I think Quay, you you pretty much have gone uh, to yourselves or, or uh, a few uh, one of a few people. And I guess I was, you know, I, I know you have a connection there, um, a heritage, heritage there. But but why why did you write about a place that your audience, your publisher, is delivering books to probably largely the people who have never been there? Yeah. So, so did you? I guess I'm saying, is there a message in the mystery? Are you are you trying to bring that world to people, or are you just writing what you know? Yeah, you know, it's a little bit of of all of that. I do I do want to bring it to uh, to people. I mean, I've always said that um, you know, there's no reason why there's no reason why you know that there's Icelandic noir and Scandinavian noir and all the other noirs that you know Africa shouldn't have its noir as well. And um, I mean, you know, because the the sort of general the general model of African fiction is, you know, the greats, uh, you know, like uh, Chinua Achebe, Things Fall Apart, those kind of things. Those are the marks that they left on African literature. Um, and it's, you know, it's very, it's very sort of, it's, it's highbrow literature. It's, uh, you know, it's um, literary fiction, I guess you should say. But hey, I just want somebody who solves mysteries and Ghana, you know, it's like, hey, you can do it in LA, you can do it in London or wherever. So why not Ghana? And um, I'll tell you that originally I had I've been in I grew up in Ghana, but I had been in the States a long time before I started to work on novels. And originally I, I had no actual I didn't have a location. I didn't have um, an area that I wanted to write about. I wrote about LA. I wrote so many different ones until I finally did an Africa, a Ghana-like country, and I sent it to um, uh, a literary agent, and she said she she liked it, but she didn't think she would sell it. But she was curious why I didn't write about Ghana itself. And the problem was I hadn't been back to Ghana in something like almost twenty years, so I I didn't really know much about the country as it was. And that's when I realized, well, you know what, you're gonna have to pay a visit. And that's when I started going back to Ghana like once a year or twice a year since 2009 to research what, you know, what what novel was coming up uh, next. So, I mean, except for COVID, I would have, you know, been there la like last year, for example, once or twice last year as I researched for the next one. But, you know, well, such as it is, I'll have to wait. Well, what what is that research like um, if you... Do you go to Ghana on these trips knowing what you're going to write and you've got a list or you have a specific thing you want to um, write about or do you go there and absorb and, and, and inspiration comes for your story? Yeah, both. But, but um, I go there and I absorb, but I, I, I definitely have in mind what, what, what I'm going to be writing next because uh, you know, the time is usually short between, let's say, two and six weeks. So I've got to be efficient. I got to know exactly what um, what I'm going to visit. And, and you're right, Michael. I, I actually literally do have a list. Do this, this, this. And it's a point list, which I check off. Sometimes I get it all done. Every once in a while, I, I don't. Like in my last trip, I desperately tried to get into the <laughs> forensic science lab, the police forensic science lab. And yeah. <laughs> they weren't having it, so it left unchecked on my list. But yeah, I, I definitely have either have have mostly written the story or I'm in, in the middle of it, but I have a very clear idea of which places I need to visit and research. You were talking a few minutes ago about African literature and, and, and you wanted to just, can somebody solve some crimes here? But um, I, I really think you have some very elegant and literary prose in your book. And, you know, I, I know people get degrees. I have a degree in creative writing and so forth, but I learned from reading. So I'm wondering if you can share who you learned from because it's really beautiful stuff. Oh, and I think it probably comes from that literary side that you were, that you were just talking about. Well, you know, when I when I was a kid, I I loved mysteries. Uh, you know, I was eight or nine, and I was reading uh, 
I devoured Sherlock Holmes. I devoured um, Dorothy Sayers, Agatha Christie, of course. Um, and, uh, you know, I was so inspired. I used to, <laughs> I used to write my own little novellas, either in longhand or on a, uh, or typed it out. Uh, to them. I, I also had, um, I like drawing, so I would design my my book jacket covers, and then um, I would staple the pages together, and voila, you had uh, self publishing. So, um, but yeah, those, uh, you know, the, I I've been interested in that for a very long time, and um, it wasn't so much that I just enjoyed reading it, but I also I kind of wanted to uh, reproduce it as well. So, um, you know, I had a number of different different heroes. I had a, a bunch of five kids who went around solving mysteries. I had the one guy who was like a sort of James Bond character. So yeah, it, it started a long time ago, a very long time ago. Yeah. So it, it, that may be why it seems, um, yeah, it's, it's just something that has been with me for a long time. Um, you said a few minutes ago, why not Ghana, when you were thinking about where to set, set a book and, uh, you know, why not a crime novel in Ghana? And, and here we are. Um, but why is Ghana a great place to set crime fiction? Um, is it a place of mystery? Do you feel like you're looking over your shoulder? Uh, you know, I always feel like I'm so lucky. I write about LA because you never know what's going to happen. And you do have to look over your shoulder here a bit. And, uh, you know, so I kind of come out of the blocks with this great advantage. What was your advantage with Ghana? Well, a couple of things. One is, um, you know, in, in contrast to some some place like LA, which is, I mean, it's basically, it's basically develops, there may be changes here and there, you may, I mean, I don't know, make the airport bigger or something, which they should, by the way. Um, but in Ghana, you know, <laughs> The development is so rapid that um, there's a change from year to year. And um, it's fascinating to me to reflect that in my novels. I mean, in the first Darko Dawson novel, for example, Wife of the Gods, I mean, you, you barely saw a cell phone there, you know, but in 2020, where, you know, 97, 98% of people in Ghana use, you know, a cell phone and, and you know, the expensive ones of that. So you just see that monumental change between the two. And then at the same time, as Ghana it evolves technologically, it's still got some of those real old beliefs, tr the traditional beliefs. So, you know, in my novels, you see a lot of reference to um, uh, the 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 incorrect term is witch doctors it should be you should say things like a fetish priest or a traditional priest they're not really witch doctors but you see reference to fetish priests so-called juju curses um and and those play into the mystery that's the funny thing and you know in west in west in western literature or western uh crime fiction it's very it's so it's cut and dried in terms of you know, clues, suspects, witnesses, but you don't have this confounding factor of what people believe in, you know, even even superstition. And I think that's an important, to me, that's an important ingredient in, in so-called African noir or African fiction. You've got this additional spiritual, um, spiritual component uh, for example, in The Missing American, you, you meet a guy, you meet some of these guys called Sakawa boys, who um, they're instant internet tricksters or fraudsters, but they use spir spir spiritualism, as they call it, as their, their background to be more and more effective in, you know, scamming people. So, um, and that, that spiritual, spiritual, aspect is really very strong. People will talk about in Ghana, you might talk about the spirit. It's not a death where somebody came and stabbed you, but somewhere some a spiritual force came along and literally killed you. Um, and it, it's sort of hard for us to wrap our, our, our brain around it. Um, 
but I met one of these priests once and he said, he told a story about a young guy in his twenties who got uh, sort of in, enveloped with this, these powers by wearing a certain kind of amulet around his neck. And it turned out that the, 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 the power was too much for him. He couldn't handle it. And so one day he, you know, he stood up and he just staggered and just fell over dead. And they called it a spiritual death because there was no obvious reason why, except that he had taken on a lot of, he had taken on a lot of um, this power from a fetish priest. So you get things like that. And so when you throw that into a mystery, it's, it's kind of confounding. And it also makes you think beyond the usual, oh, here's a clue, here's a cue, here's a clue, here's a clue. Because you've got this added in ingredient of spiritualism. Which, which I don't personally believe in, but it sure as hell fascinates me. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm a sci I'm a scientist at heart, but I love to hear about this kind of stuff. You know, no matter how ridiculous it sounds. Well, Sakawa boys, uh, fetish priests, you did a deep dive into that for the last book, the Mr. Yeah. American. Um, you got any good stories? Was there any kind? Uh, I assume you were hanging out with these people um it seems to me um like when i do research i'm usually if i have an escort i it's usually a detective a cop so i feel protected um you go over there with your checklist and are ending up with uh research into these uh, as you say very mysterious mystical type things uh where are you ever scared or, you, or do you have a safety net uh any any good stories <laughs> Yeah, the trick, the trick is always to go with, with somebody who knows their way around and you need to make contacts, you know, beforehand so that, because the thing is, um, for example, I may, I my I look black to you guys, right? But as soon as I go to Ghana, forget it. I'm called lit, um, Oberoni, which literally means either white man or foreigner. In other words, they can see me coming from a mile away. Um, and I'm not Ghanaian in their eyes, uh, you know, I, I, I mean, I have some mixed heritage, so they can, they can spot it. And so, you know, if you, if you do that, you're setting yourself up to either be scanned by somebody or attacked or something. So yeah, you gotta go with somebody just like, just like you did. And in my, in my case, I did, I have, um, I have one, uh, homicide detective, um, contact there as well, but for the for the missing American, I did um, go out with um, a private detective who had a lot of contact in the Sakawa world. So he took me around, and that once you're with somebody who is you know recognized by everybody else, they'll tell you everything it, because they trust you. But otherwise, you're not going to get anywhere. You, you, you're going to, if you confront people and you're obviously not from around here, you're not going to get anything out of them. <laughs> you won't get anything out of them. So, but yeah, I, um, that, that same fetish priest, there's a scene and it looks like we're talking more about the missing American, but anyway, <laughs> there's a scene in the missing American where the, there's a crocodile. It, it's quite involved. There's a crocodile who is being kept because of um, its mystical powers. If you wear a crocodile skeleton around your neck, it makes you extremely popular, apparently. So there's this crocodile who's who was, they went to a river and they got a little baby crocodile and they brought it back and they raised it. Crocodile was huge and it was in this bathtub, this filthy bathtub. I mean, I really felt sorry for the poor creature because he was like scrunched up like this in this bathtub and obviously was not ha happy, you know. They lifted up the lid and I peeked in and there was this crocodile who opened his mouth <sighs> at me and then, whoa! <laughs> well, that's that's a good research story. Um, how, how did you, um, how'd you get that private detective, the, the PI that helped you? Did, you know, what, phone book, uh, internet, how'd you hook up that way? It's really funny. I actually got to be a, a victim of um, a crime when I was in Ghana. Um, a guy who I had had um, left my vehicle with for safekeeping 
uh, pulled a fast one on me, sold the vehicle and ran off with the money. So um, <laughs> I tried to get the police on the case. I mean, they got on the case, but yeah, if you read my novels, you see a lot of disappointment in the Ghana police uh, service. And I wasn't getting anywhere with, you know, catching this guy. So I just, I just turned to a private detective. Um, there was an agency in London who, uh, that I forget the name now, but what they do is they, um, they have their people on the ground in different countries in, in, in all over the world, but in Africa as well. So what they did is they put me in touch of, with him. And then from there, I, I went on um, to establish a relationship with him. And so he, he has helped me out a tremendous amount, especially with the missing American. Yeah. So um, Emma John, uh, I should say the Edgar nominated Emma John. <laughs> where, where, you know, she's a character for the ages now, not, not necessarily because you got a nomination or you won any awards. I mean, she just is a unique and very interesting character. Um, what, what's, what's the inspiration point for her? Where does she come from? Well, as I as I mentioned, I had I'd introduced um, at the at the end of the Darko series, Death um, by His Grace, I'd introduced a female detective who was going to be Darko's assistant. Uh, her name was um, Sappho, Mabel Sappho, and um, as I, I I started to write, well, actually, I I completed a full novel with her, um, but the thing is that Darko was still in the picture. And so when I turned it in, uh, editor was not happy. Um, so I, I had to start again. I had to rewrite the entire novel and take all the Darko references out. And then I also had to um, make a new female character. And, um, but it, you know, it's really good that I did it that way because what happened was I, I felt like um, I was starting afresh with her, with Emma, and that we could all start at you know point A and move to, to move together in a, instead of importing her from from somewhere else. So she's a character that grew that grew on me. She was she was very timid in the beginning um, and very diffident and sort of tentative. Um, and then she she blossomed as as the book went along and I, I was able to see her grow in front of me myself. I hadn't, I hadn't really planned her out in any particular way. She just continued to improve as, as time went on. And um, so now she's in the second book, she's much more established and uh, much more confident in herself now because, you know, she's got one, <laughs> one case under her belt. So she's, you know, feeling more like she can handle a lot more than she used to. And the second novel is a little bit more of an uh, ensemble piece than the first one where we concentrated more on uh, Emma and her boss, Yemo Soa. But in the second one, we have a sort of an ensemble piece with all, with all the, guy, the other guys in the agency that she works with. And uh, I kind of enjoyed bouncing off, you know, the, seeing their interactions with each other and bouncing off, you know, repartee and stuff between the two in, in, in a way that was very, very natural. But em, so Emma is, is wholly created. I guess I was getting at like, did you draw from uh, your mother or anyone else in your life? That, is, there, is there someone, uh, you know, a real inspiration in your life that's recognizable in Emma or have you done the, the really writerly thing of wholly creating her? Well, you know the parts the parts that come from somebody I know are probably um, subconscious. Um, any any strength or resistance to to male uh, domineering is is probably my mom. <laughs> Don't mess with my mom. Um, and then the the sort of the sort of the the diffident part of her the, of Emma, which as she was coming up. It's probably, but nobody that I can put my, my, my finger on. In other words, I start, I try to start creating a character who is, who is herself, but then 
but you know my subconscious will feed will will feed something in there and i may not i may not even be aware that, that that's happening so it's hard for me to define her against one uh, one particular person yeah mike don't don't let me blast in here so you know make this sound like a really female question but i was really fascinated with using the fashion industry as a background for this book and part of the reason is that i'm very fond of ian hamilton's books a uh, writer from Toronto who writes about an, um, a gay Asian uh, woman who's half Chinese and, well, all Chinese, but lives in Canada. And, mm. and Ian comes from a business background, so she's basically a money recovery specialist in those things. And he takes her into various industries like the seafood industry, whatever. But one of his books really goes into the fashion industry, particularly in Italy and Milan. And, yeah. and oh, then, yeah. um, the problem with talk about prescient with the global supply chain from China for the Mil Milanese fashion people and how that can be disrupted. So it's like a pre-COVID, you know, book in yeah, a way. But, yeah. but that reminded me that, you know, there's an incredible amount of money and influence in fashion and possibly yeah. Instagram. I was talking to Mike about following him on Instagram to see the the wrap up of Bosch and so forth, but no doubt that's really highlighted it. So is is Ghana or is Accra particularly noted for fashion? I mean, is it, you know, a center of African fashion? Why did you pick that? Um, you know, it, it, they they have, there is a, a, an Accra Fashion Week. And of course that was part of the period during which the, the, the Sleep Well My Lady w was set in that, um, you know, Lady Araba, who is the, the fashion icon, uh, was one night before a big, you know, runway show when, when she was killed, when she was murdered. Um, but yes, I, I would say, um, especially, well, yeah, both men and women, they do, they do like, the uh, Ghanaians like to dress up. Uh, <laughs> there's no two ways about it. I mean, you're all you're all you're, you're probably familiar with um, the the kente cloth. It's a, it's a specific design that um, uh, you might have seen. Uh, I think well, who was it? Nancy Pelosi and some of the people uh, had some kente stalls on once, and uh, after they made paid a visit to Ghana, and then and then somebody said, "Hey, hey, wait up, wait up, wait up! The, 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 the stop appropriate." <laughs> misappropriating the Kente cloth. <laughs> Nobody gave you permission to wear that. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it, that comes from Ghana, specifically from the Ashanti people. And there are many, many fashions built around the whole Kente cloth. And there's one particular um, brand that I, I make a reference to called Woodin, that's W-O, O D I N. That's that's a very uh, very upscale um, very upscale uh, print and fabric uh, based based in Ghana, but recognized worldwide. So yeah, I would say I would say uh, fashion is 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 big there, definitely. Um, you uh, earlier said you're a man of science. Um, you're you're a physician, a, a surgeon, no less. How, where's where's the writing come from? Was there was being a, a doctor uh, a sidetrack from something you said you from an early age you were reading some of these classic authors and so forth? Were you thinking about being a writer back then, but went to med school, or is it something yeah. later? Yeah, almost exactly like that. I I wanted to be a writer before I wanted to be a a doctor. So the the writing part was like between say eight and 11. And then I, I got interested in, in medicine. Um, I, uh, I, I devoured a lot of uh, medical books as, as well as, you know, fiction. And um, it got to the point that I, you know, was diagnosing people in my head or out, out loud. It's probably a pain in the ass actually. Uh, so, oh, I think that person has, I don't know, thyroid disease. <laughs> I probably was wrong at the time, but yeah. So by the time I by the time I was a, a teenager, I wanted to be a, a physician, and and so that part of that part of me, you know, kept going till you know I graduated, and then I 
came out as a physician. And one day I was in the intensive care unit looking after a patient. Uh, I guess I was looking a little despondent because one of the uh, nurses who knew me well asked me what was wrong. And I said, I don't know, this whole MD thing just seems so anticlimactic. <laughs> and she, she said, well, what is it that what is it that you really would love to do? And I said, I've, I've always wanted to be a writer. And she asked me, well, what's what's stopping you? And uh, so she suggested I go to UCLA Extension and do a, a course in creative writing. And then once once I got out of that, then I joined a a, a, a writing group, a private writing group. Um, and I was there for a good four years or so. And then, you know, the time that time came when you had when you said, well, you know what, I got to do this by myself. So that's when I started writing, not for, you know, a, a book club every every week. Um, and, you know, for a long time, I did the two things I did writing and medicine at the same time. And um, kind of a blur right now. <laughs> But I retired from medicine in 2018 to write full time. Um, just because number one, I had promised myself I would. And number two, my, you know, it was getting harder and harder to schedule me, to schedule events around my my schedule because, you know, I was working Monday through Friday. Wednesday, Wednesdays were off, but Mondays through Fridays. And it's, it's hard to get spots, especially pre-COVID. You actually had to travel to the place. so. I was kind of limited to everything that was close by on the West Coast. Um, you know, there's a lot of, of, you know, four day trips that I could take, you know, to the East Coast or something like that. So uh, that is one good thing about Zoom. You don't have to fly. <laughs> yeah. So did you uh, miss being a physician during this pandemic? Or are you glad not to be involved in that? Well, you know, I, I wanted, I, I did, I did want to, um contribute what i what i wanted to do was do some telemedicine because that you know that's just exploded um now that you know it, it's it was more for a while nobody could even go to see a doctor that's different now but for a while it was different and so a tele telemedicine just ex exploded and I mean, I, I wanted to contribute, but um, I, I don't know, I guess the competition was stiff or something. One one problem is that um, if they see that you, you've retired for a couple of years, they get suspicious that ah, maybe you don't know your stuff, you're rusty and stuff like that. So I think I probably got turned down a couple of times, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah, you think, right? You think they really needed me, but no, apparently not. So, oh, well. <laughs> well, you had a a good career to go to, anyway. Um, yeah, you're you're you're. I think facing some. I've had a little bit of this going on. You 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 know you've written several Darko um, novels. Then you come out with uh, Emma John and and uh, you know a character. I'm sure you you really love writing about. And sometimes it's hard, you, you create something new and it's hard to go back to uh, what you've done before, even yeah. if it's a character you love. But you kind of mentioned earlier that we will see Darko again. What, yeah. What's the um, prognosis, I'll use a medical term there, uh, for Darko Dawson uh, in the future? Well, I mean, I, th I think it's pretty good. I will, this actual, the upcoming novel that I'm writing now was actually going to be with Darko. Um, but Soho, in all his wisdom, said, you know, it's it's a little early to jump back to Darko. I, they felt I need to get at least three, three of Emma in before I, I return. I mean, and the reason why I do want to return is that a lot of people have, have begged me, please let's see Darko again. And um, you know, in the on the last one was a little bit of a cliffhanger, and that some people think you know he actually died. He he didn't die. He almost died. Um, sounds like a Sir Arthur Conan Doyle Sherlock Holmes scenario. You know that Sir Sir Arthur Conan Doyle had to bring Sherlock Holmes back because when he killed him off, everybody was furious with him. <laughs> so yeah, so he's coming back, but. Um, 
you know, Soho want to, you know, go with Emma for a, a little bit. So fingers crossed, it'll be, let's say, uh, maybe 2023. Yeah, 2023, maybe. Hope, uh, God willing. Would they ever cross paths? Um, I think I'd feel weird if they did. I mean, it's an idea, but I, I don't know. It, it would feel strange. <laughs> or maybe he could make a cameo, or she could make a cameo. I think that would be fun. <laughs> um, Patrick, anything come in from Facebook? Any questions from Barbara or Patrick? Um, yeah, I'm watching the Facebook feed right here, right now. And um, actually, uh, if you allow me to ask, ask a quick question, Quay, um, yeah. I was really intrigued about what, what you were talking about with the, you know, the whole spiritual, cultural background in the stories. Yeah. Is, the, is there, and I, I suppose that part of this is what your books are about, but is there a point where the, the law enforcement community and that whole cultural background uh, kind of have an uneasy relationship with each other? I mean, do the police obviously are, are very familiar with the culture and are a part yeah. of the culture. Yeah. Um, how do those two elements work together? Well, you know, I, I think um, <clears throat> I think from what I can what I can tell, talking to uh, detectives and so on, there is that they do partition things quite well, so that you know, there's the work and then there's there's the beliefs. I know that a lot of them probably believe quite a bit in that sort of, of thing. However, I don't, I don't think they allow it to, um, to sort of throw off, throw them off completely. Um, in other words, they know what's the sort of professional line to go down. And then I think they would, they would keep their, you know, those sort of personal beliefs um, in the background uh, for them. But I can also see a scenario where some policemen may not want to investigate a particular murder if they feel, for example, that there is something dark and sinister behind it. I could see that. And actually, uh, hey, actually, that's a good idea. <laughs> I just, <laughs> it just gave me an idea. Full credit, full credit. Um, that they would not be interested in in investigating that kind of thing. I, I, I could see that happening. I could see that happening. Yeah. It's interesting. I think about, and Barbara, you chime in, but I think about some of the the, the New Orleans kind of crime novels and the, mm. the cultural background. Yeah. Know, deep, you know, real out of the city and deep into the. Into yeah. The yeah. There's, there's Which is basically that. African in origin absolutely anyway, absolutely so. yeah, yeah i wanted to you know concomitant to patrick's question there lady araba who's a really interesting character or kind of you know eileen fisher or helena rubenstein or whatever you want to call it um comes from a very religious family so when you say religious family what does that mean does that mean they're naturally conservative do they resent her success do they think that it's wrong for her to be the kingpin of this empire you know should i mean i don't know how much of that do women have agency to use the new modern phraseology i mean i've always had agency so i have a lot of trouble understanding women who don't have agency but here i am <laughs> asking the question because i think it would be difficult you well, know, you know especially I, in a religious family where yeah those roles are already pretty much established and hard, yeah. to, hard to break through yeah yeah well you know the the religion um, you know, the religion is a kind of, um, what should I say? It's, it's a kind of institution that is not, it's not necessarily, um, it, it doesn't necessarily come into practice, uh, day to day. In other words, um, she, you, you can be religious, but go ahead and do whatever you want to do. In other words, it's kind of a going to church kind of religion and not a, um, I don't, I think certain things are a sin religion. In other words, um, for example, <laughs> take, take, for example, homosexuality in, in Ghana. Um, actually, the only people that, that really harp on and on about it 
are the uh, religious leaders and some government leaders, but nobody else cares, <laughs> you know? So, you know, even if you go to church every every Sunday, it's not it's not gonna make you turn around and say, oh, I think gayness is, is wrong. It's really only the leaders who are saying so. So it's, it's, a, it's a kind of artificial, I would say it's a kind of artificial institution that isn't necess doesn't necessarily necessarily reflect the way people really feel about things, and you know, so in in Lady Araba's case, I mean, I don't think there would be any. In fact, I think uh, her family would be really proud of her. The only issue with her was the false piety of her father, um, but that's you know that's an individual thing. Other people. I mean, her aunt, for example, Auntie Dele said, hey, go for it. This this is, you know, be be whatever you want to be. And um, and and the other thing you should remember is that in the in the informal economy in Ghana, the informal in economy is run by uh, most of it, like 80 percent, 80 to 90 percent is run by women. So we're talking farming, marketing, bringing things to, um, you know, carrying stuff to um, the market, all of that is done by women. So they have a, a quite a powerful position there. And um, I have not seen any instance in, for, for example, in, in, in government, for example, where a woman is, is outwardly, at least obviously disrespected because she's a woman. Now, it may be something private in people's heads, but uh, outwardly, I don't see that. So, so women have, they have a good, a good position in Ghana, I would say. In general, they do. So when you were drafting the book, was she always going to be the victim? Or did you, you know, I've often I've often wondered about that. We we've talked to authors, Mike, who, you know, come up with a different who done it, a different villain at the end sometimes. But I, I don't think I've ever asked anybody, was was the, the first victim always the first victim, or did it evolve while you were writing the book? Uh, the the victim the victim is always uh, is established for me the victim is established at the very beginning and and doesn't change the only the only other thing that might happen is that um, a second murder might pop up but the the first the first victim is always the first victim what does change for me is the murderer I had three different murderers in <laughs> the missing in in um, sleep well my lady and none of them worked and. Um, and then it was really funny. It hit me one night that um, I I should have realized who the murderer was because I left the clue myself, <laughs> which I promptly missed. <laughs> so um, yeah, no, she she was going to be the the victim, and and one of the, the reason is that she was she's actually based on a, a real uh, character, a real person by the name of Kareen Chepchumba who was a Kenyan, a young Kenyan woman, 33 year old, who was found murdered in her bed. In fact, somebody thought she was asleep and that's where the, the, the name Sleep Well, My Lady comes from. Um, and she had fall, gotten involved with a, um, a very influential and famous uh, TV anchorman in, um, in Kenya. And um, to this day, the, 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 it happened 2012, and to this day, the mystery is unsolved. So that was actually the, the original premise uh, for, the, for the mystery. After that, the similarities are very fleeting, but that was the, basically the, 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 um, the base of, of my story. Well, thank you. Mike, have, have you ever changed the victim when you've been writing one of your books? I don't think so. I think uh, I agree with Quay. It's kind of a starting point. And I have changed who did it um, as I've gotten into a book. But but usually I don't start writing a book till I have, I guess what you call the inciting moment. I, I know who's been killed and, yeah. and, and kind of have a light at the end of the tunnel that yeah. you head off to. And sometimes that light changes. But the uh, the starting point for me has always kind of been the same. Yeah. Patrick, any, any questions yeah. arise? I do have a few more questions here. Um, well, this is more of a comment, but a viewer named Kathleen says that um, Quay often brings global perspectives to Ghanaian novels, uh, environmental destruction, uh, informal or unregulated gold miners from China, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Do you, uh, 
how do you kind of weave that stuff in? Is there is there a particular maybe topic that you'd like to kind of salt in as the background for for uh, readers who may not be familiar with the culture to yeah. you know to take away? Yeah. So like in all the Darko novels, there's 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 a socioeconomic a socio and or economic element behind it. So so like in Wife of the Gods, the first one is it was about these indentured young women who um, are given to a fetish priest by a family because of some uh, some misfortune or some um, uh, some crime committed sometimes generations before for which they're trying to atone. So the fetish priest offers them protection in, you know, in return for this young woman who's going to do all his work and plant all the stuff and, you know, another example of just being a male, you know what. Um, and then what happens there is that a young medical student who is railing against that system gets gets killed. So that bring that brings that issue around this indentured servitude. It's called uh, Trocosi, uh, which it was an issue years and years ago. I think it's dying out now. It's a it's a little known uh, custom of a very small enclave. And then in the second the second one, Children of the Street, which Michael I think you read, um, it, it's it's a serial killer among. The, the all the homeless the young homeless youth the homeless youth in in Accra Ghana and then like, like you mentioned murder at Cape Three Points that was all about oil the discovery of oil in in Ghana in 2007 which led to a lot of uh, clashes between the the local people and the big oil companies um, and then the fourth one was about gold mining illegal gold mining and then the fifth one was mostly about religion mostly about religion ghana is extreme I, you mentioned religion but it's a very religious country to 2012 i think it was voted the most religious country in the world a, a dubious honor in my in my opinion but <laughs> yeah so there's always some some issue in the back and then of course with the missing american it was this the the internet fraud sleep well my lady is a little different in that it doesn't take on a well i don't know maybe it does i'm not i don't know maybe um barbara you might have a different i was going to say it doesn't take on a big big social issue issue but maybe that that's not true because it does deal with um you know uh sexual assault and so on so that's a big issue too. So yeah, yeah. No, it does and entrepreneurial stuff, you know. In yeah. A, in a developing country, um, yeah. I think is really fascinating. Yeah. So I said I don't know that everybody thinks that fashion is an industry, and that was the, really the root of my question. Oh, I there see what you're so saying. So much money involved yeah. in fashion, but it's not just money. It's because of social media. There is this extraordinary influence now that fashion has, and you know, I've read various things uh, about you know so much of the world's landfill is now composed of people disposing of clothes you know cheap clothing means that people can you know yes i used to go absolutely. to a, a nail salon and the woman who owned it literally wore something new every day she was like marie antoinette on a, on a whole yeah. different scale you know where <laughs> you had to wear a new dress every day if you were marie antoinette yeah. it's yeah. the same thing and so um I, I, there's a lot of power in and clothing is symbols. And yes. you know, if you go to Santa Fe and you see the Sikhs sitting down to eat together, you know, in their white robes and their turbans and all, yeah. I mean, that is there's a lot of things involved in their clothes about yeah. who they are and why they're together and can you break in and you know, a lot of lots of questions. And so yeah. I thought it was yeah. interesting that you um that you chose that as a background. I have another question. I don't mean this to sound like a real wise ass or anything, but <laughs> you're talking about West African literature. Is there East African crime fiction? Is there, I mean, Patrick and Michael and I have talked about South African, you know, Dion Meyer and guys yeah. like that, but that seems to me quite different. Yeah. But why do you call it specifically, because I looked, looked at your website before we got here tonight, that you're particularly espousing West African 
crime fiction. And I'm wondering, does that mean there is an East African crime fiction? And if so, how is it different? Well, the, um, I know um, uh, Makum, Makuma Wangugi, he's, he's uh, in, <laughs> he's the son of, uh, oh, I, I don't want to mess his name up, but uh, son of very well-known Kenyan, um, uh, I think he, he had, he got the Nobel Prize for Literature. He writes detective fiction. I, to my knowledge, he has three novels out, maybe. Um, then, then there's, there's, there's Michael Sears um, in, down in Botswana, and of course, Alexander McCall Smith. And then Dion Maya, like you said, and um, Jess, Jess, Jessie McKenzie, right? She's uh, South African too. Um, I, you know, I don't, I don't know enough about what's written there to be able to say there's an East African fiction. I, I don't know enough to be able to say. But you know, for me, I'm more, a little bit more comfortable calling it West African, just because you know, I, I I've grown up in Ghana and I've I've, I've visited the other um, uh, West African countries, Nigeria and so on. Um, I have been to Kenya and South Africa, but I, I I don't know I don't know them well enough to be able to say you know an East African versus a West African. Um, I mean I I think African fiction is a good enough umbrella, and if you if you want to subgenre it into West and East, maybe you can. But I I, I wouldn't have a formula for that. Okay, Patrick, back to you. I have, I have a question, which I, I think may be a plan, but that's okay. Uh, uh, the question is, I'm curious if on Quay's checklist of places he needs to research, he also includes regional specialty foods he needs to eat during research. Yeah, well, you know, actually I was thinking of either having like a recipe book or, or some recipes at the back of one of my books. Um, because the food, yeah, there are very interesting variations in food in, in, in Ghana as well. So it's, um, and, and I do mention a lot of food there mostly because, um, mostly because Juliet Grames at Soho loves food porn as she calls it. She, <laughs> I once, <laughs> I once mentioned a meal and she wrote in the margin, she wrote, more we need to know more about it what what does it taste like what does it look like and so uh from then on i started describing my meals in depth because otherwise juliet would <laughs> ask me for more details so so yeah it's it's definitely an idea definitely an idea i think I, i'll think about it for for the next novel i have a couple of really interesting comments and slash questions from uh, a gentleman here whose name I'm gonna completely blow the pronunciation. So excuse me, but Ebenezer is the first name. Uh, and he says, my Ghanaian classmate um, from Paga in Northern Ghana at the Catholic University of Paris during our third year abroad uh, told me that he believed his soul was a crocodile. Uh, he was a brilliant Catholic student himself who had attended Notre Dame secondary school. That's a really interesting insight there. See? Yeah. 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 Well, you know, Paga is, is the place where, where they have um, so-called domesticated uh, crocodiles. And um, they, they're, f <laughs> they're fed very well by the people of Paga because all tourists go up to Paga to see them, you know, crushing the bones of chickens, live chickens, I might add. And, um, yeah. and then what you do is you... you <laughs> You, you you can sit on the back of one of the crocodiles or and yank on his tail and uh, traditionally they never do anything to you um mm. because the story <laughs> the legend is that um a person uh, uh, somebody from the village of paga was being chased by a lion and as when he got to the lake he was basically trapped between the lake and the lion and the crocodile came along and offered him a ride. So he got on his back and you know, took him away to safety. So from then on, the vow was you never kill a crocodile or harm a crocodile. And uh, in that in that village, it's considered a blessing if a crocodile comes and like sits outside your door, for example. Uh, you step out the door and there's a crocodile and you say, good morning. and. 
<laughs> so that's yeah. So um, I've been up there too uh, twice, and it's um, very interesting. Apparently, they don't kill anybody. That's what they say. <laughs> Domesticated crocodile sounds like an oxymoron to me. <laughs> <laughs> I really have trouble with that. So, so before we're done, Mr. Conley, catch us up a little bit with you. Two things. You are going to have um, Bosch season seven is done, as we've said. What is the news about Mickey? Because you are just announced that there will be a Mickey Hargit Day series. Um, yeah, the... Um... There's a writing room going right now for a Netflix show based on the Lincoln Lawyer series. And uh, I was actually in that writing room on a Zoom before I jumped over here. Um, and Are you starting going... with the second book, Mike? Or you're not going to try to revisit the Lincoln Lawyer and McConaughey, right? We are a little bit um, in the way that Bosch mixed stories. Uh, oh, okay. so, um, we, you know, there was a movie, and so we felt like we don't want to base the whole first season on something that was already out. Yeah. So, so we went to the second book, but we we're recapturing in a little bit of a different way the first book. Um, and so, and like so far, so good. It's uh, it's coming along, and uh, we're supposed to start filming. Everything's COVID related or COVID uh, based on what happens COVID wise, but we're scheduled to start filming and. March 30th. We'll see if it happens. Anybody interested in the writing with, room? with COVID, right? The filming. Um, yeah, I mean, it's tough. I mean, we um, we filmed Bosch. We started filming Bosch in August and we finished last week. We had a lot of safety protocols. We got tested every day. Um, mask and, and plastic visors for everybody. It was... Um, is pretty significant. We we got all the way through with one person uh, testing positive. They didn't. They were asymptomatic, but we had to close down for two weeks just because of that. Yeah. And then we got lucky, and nothing else, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, happened or or ne necessitated a yeah. shutdown. The only negative was we all we worked through the holidays, the week between Christmas and New Year's. We had to work. To make up for the two weeks we uh, yeah. we missed, yeah. so um, you know, otherwise uh, it's it's been pretty good. Yeah. It wasn't the uh, it wasn't the shocker who got COVID, was it? Uh, no, <laughs> Patrick has a fixation on our newsman on the show. <laughs> uh, okay, there we go. So, Mike, what book is it that is next coming out for you? Are you um, writing in in part towards the TV, or are you just Motoring I'm on, writing, regardless. I'm writing a, uh, a Ballard book right now. Uh, Harry Bosch will be in it, and and not a not in a big. It's not an equal billing, I guess you'd say. But uh, I mean, I don't know for sure. I, I, I just started in December, and uh, you know, I know who the like we just talked about Clay. I know who the victim is, and now, now I'm writing the story, and I know Bosch is going to come into it. I don't plan to have them be in it in a significant way, but things change, you know, when you're writing. Do you have a May book coming out? Because that must be already done. No, just one book this year. One book this year. Okay, yeah. so it'll be in the fall then or in your yeah. usual slot. I, yeah. Yeah, well, bummer. We won't get to see you as often, but maybe we can lure you to talk to another author. I miss you when we don't see you on a regular basis. <laughs> well, as Clay said, the Zoom thing, it's good and bad. I mean, it's always great to be in a place and, and meet yeah. people and so forth, but you can uh, you can cover a lot of ground with Zoom. Yeah. For one yeah. day when my book came out, I was in three continents in one day through Zoom. Yeah. Well, we have the same experience. We were in England with Kate Moss, not the model Kate Moss, but the writer Kate Moss and yeah. Brad Meltzer in Florida at one o'clock this afternoon. And now here we are. Um, yeah. I came home. Patrick stole at the store. Thanks to the snowstorm. No, he's just where he is. I still can't get past the snowstorm. I mean, I grew up in Chicago where a snowstorm was like an everyday thing, but it's been so long since I've been in one, especially ever actually in Arizona. Patrick, do you remember one? N not really. I mean, sometimes the mountains will get a little dusting on them, yeah. but it won't right last. Yeah. I'm deeply suspicious of the polar vortex. I think it's... <laughs> amazing things to us. So um, if you don't have any more questions, Patrick, we should thank both Quay and Michael. Well, I, I had one question. I had one question for Michael. Oh, uh, and that is, 
I, I assume that it's it took a lot less time for this series to get to, to the Lincoln Lawyer series to get to Netflix than Bosch got to Amazon, right? Um, yeah, but I have to say it was because of um, David Kelly. David Kelly um, is funny. He reached out to me when the first book came out about 15 years ago. Yeah. Said he wanted to do a TV show. And I had to tell him, I'm sorry, I already sold it to a movie company. Um, but he's, he kind of circled back and said he won, he still wanted to do it. So uh, I'm lucky that I could attach it to David Kelly because wherever he goes, you know, whatever network he goes into and says, can I make a show for you? They say, yeah, absolutely. So uh, I got very lucky there. Yeah, yeah, because that that there's some uh, the the options on on Darko and Emma, but I always I always remember how you described your experience as being development hell. <laughs> yeah, I um, always remember you, know, when you said that. <laughs> just uh, you know, like Emma John, be you know, be steadfast and uh, persistent. Uh, <laughs> you know, I had a lot of disappointments with Bosch but then ultimately I couldn't I'm so glad nothing ever happened because now mm -hmm. I have you know 68 yeah. episodes of a show that I was very much involved in yeah. and if something had happened earlier I'm sure they would have like patted me on the head and said run along while we while sure. we make this yeah, so yeah. It, it ended up being um, a good good thing but yeah. at the time it was development hell it didn't feel like a good thing but <laughs> Ultimately, I can look back and be happy. Yeah, yeah that's great. I don't think there's any question that COVID has really accelerated long form storytelling books to, to video in a way that would not have been possible without this enormous captive audience and people eating things up. Um, I mean, the French have done some astonishing stuff. If you haven't watched Call My Agent, I'm telling you, you really want to watch all four seasons. It is the most amazing writing. You just. What is it called? It's called Call My Agent. Okay. And it's um, it, it's just started season four, but it is, it is one of the most unpredictable. You just, every time you think you know where it's going and then it doesn't. I mean, you know, Dana Stabenow is staying with us right now, escaping the Alaskan winter. And she's good at, at spotting how things are gonna go. And she's been just as baffled as I have, so I don't feel so stupid. Um, and it's, know, it's, um, on what? it's on what? It's, it's on, on Netflix. Really? Yeah, and it's just, it's absolutely brilliant. And then, you know, in a completely different way, a lot right. of people are enthralled with Bridgerton, and it's really not the story. I mean, you know, it's classic romantic tropes, and, you yeah. know, but right. the production values, I have to tell you, even Rob, who would rather probably open a vein than read a romance novel, Rob is watching Bridgerton, my husband was. <laughs> I have never seen anything as magnificent as the clothes, as the coaches yeah. and carriages yeah. and the horses and yeah. the backgrounds. I mean, they have been spectacular. And I think it's going to up the game. I mean, I've watched all the Jane Austen movies and stuff because I love that stuff. None of them have had production values like this. So I'm now wondering, Mike, if you know that kind of production value is going to force other series to, to up, the, especially in historicals I'm talking about, to really up their game um and you know and do a more a more brilliant job if this show doesn't win the best costume award it will be a true travesty i think about edith head she's probably like you know ripping her heart out with her scissors wherever she is in the great beyond so there's so much international stuff to watch there have been great australian shows if you haven't watched the heart guy uh, or dr blake or you know there's a, a noir series i can't remember what it's called so it's been fun. We're talking about COVID mixing things up, but we've been all around the world watching great yeah. storytelling on television from yeah. all different countries. Iceland, brilliant series set in Finland called The Border, Border Town, I think. Yes. Yeah, oh one. my God, it was that fabulous. That amazing. And, one. and I noticed that that our language skills are improving <laughs> as, we're, as yeah. we're listening to the subtitles. We're still picking up, you know, the French yeah. or the Italian, yeah. probably not the Icelandic. Definitely not the finish, yeah. but it's we, really been remarkable to do that. Yeah. Mike, have you if you had any interest in foreign um, companies doing Bosch or or um, 
Mickey in, in a different language in a different country? Uh, there was an inquiry recently, I don't know where it stands now, um, in, in India of, of taking our scripts from Bosch and dubbing them or redoing them. Taking the show, make their own show with the same scripts. Really? You know, and set wow. it in Mumbai or somewhere. I, I, sure. I don't really have an exact handle on what they want to do. I think they're going to put together a presentation. Well, I mean, if we're all watching Call My Agent, you know, non-French speaking audience reading subtitles and being perfectly okay with it, then I would think that American shows equally could be brought to other countries yeah. and they use their own subtitles, you know. Oh, so. I mean, well, the existing show is, is all over the world, yeah. You know, Amazon's in all the countries, so is Netflix. Right. Yeah. I think it's really exciting. I feel like it's making us more global. Um, and, you know, the Zoom technology, tiresome yeah. as it may be to be on Zoom a lot, has really brought us all together in some remarkable ways. Well, Barbara, I mean, you mentioned Bridgerton. Actually, a, a, a friend of mine <laughs> in Ghana texted me and, and she said, she said, oh, my God, I just love this Bridgerton. <laughs> so it's you're right. It's all I'm over. telling you, it's the close. It really <laughs> is the close. <laughs> On that shallow note, why don't I? Anyway, it's been a delight, Quay, to see you. Um, I, you're not far away from us, but you haven't been to see no. us often. So I hope that you will be able to come in the yes. you know, in real time but meanwhile um done. it's been Thank wonderful mike it's by. great to see you again thanks so much for agreeing to do this hey thanks for including me you betcha you, good, good, night. Good, good, good night everybody and thank you all for watching and don't forget we do have autographed copies of oh i keep losing it there we go with my screen sweet well my lady and i think do we sell out of the missing american pattern oh yeah yeah so our signed copies of the missing american are gone however there may still be some, so I'll investigate that tomorrow. I might send you some more.